I'm Jan Worm and we're in my studio in Berkeley right now and I'm very happy that Wendy Martin is here with me today and that we'll be having a conversation about art, life, the creative life, mm -hmm. um, women in contemporary society and anything else that crosses our minds and our, um, our day today. Yeah. So we're talking about the different, the different phases of a painting and if you could arrest it at, yeah. at a moment and have a record of, say, several of the very important moments, the way Hockney did it. I mean, you wouldn't want to necessarily do that all the time, all the time, but it would be nice to have the capacity, I guess, yeah. Yeah. to kind of capture some of the process. Um, on the other hand, I would say, you know, the more you look at a painting, as I've been sitting across from this one in particular, the more you see, and that's an important aspect of viewing art. I mean, for the person who's looking mm -hmm. to be encouraged to linger longer with the painting in any, in one, inter in its final iteration, we'll say, is pretty important. I mean, I hadn't, you mentioned that, that people don't tend to do that in museums so much anymore. You know, tend to take a selfie or you know, listen to their audio device talking about the painting, but aren't necessarily just sitting there letting themselves discover uh, depths and other dimensions. Um, when you're painting, do you, do you think about that? I mean, do you think about creating a sufficiently rich image, texture, you know, sufficiently complex that someone's going to want to live with it for a while? Or is it because you're living with it? <laughs> so, no, I don't think about other people living with the painting. I think about the painting having its own life. Mm. And um, I, I think that, I mean, one works on a painting until it presents itself and says it's here, <laughs> you uh -huh. know? Uh, but there are, I mean, you know, when you're spending hours and days and weeks with the painting you have a lot of different thoughts so in the beginning it's oh my god it's so much fun to like put paint on <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's just the sheer i mean it's a very yeah. physical kind of thing it's very exciting um there's a thrill there's a true rush that just comes out of squeezing paint out of wow. a tube uh -huh. it is such a biochemical thing just the act of painting uh -huh. and the physical aspects of it. And then there's pleasure in certain kinds of, of mark making and, and brush and movement that has a feel to it, just the way different dances affect you. Mm. You know, the way if, if you can enjoy dancing and then if you're doing a waltz, it has a different feel to it and the body and the imagination go with different music. So the same thing happens with painting. You paint and you move differently in painting at different stages. The beginning mm. is very open in movement and, 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 and is faster, then it's slower, more considered, then it might have areas that are build up and are faster again. So you have that physicality of it. The painting itself, the very yeah. act of painting, yeah. carries so much that um, mm. that we who get to do it <laughs> can enjoy. I mean, it's it's an in, intense experience. In terms of what happens and what you're doing and stepping back and looking at it, there's so much analytical involvement in terms yeah. of color and palette and what you're doing and where you go next. and what you're going to do to something and then every day when you come back and see what you've done the day before it's starting all over again because you're looking at it and it's not the way you were seeing it after working on it for hours that you know when you've left it you come back to it and it's always and then you always say oh yes I wanted to do this I wanted to do that I want to work on it and then for me I you know I I have my painting downstairs, I work downstairs, and then at the end I bring it up and then it gets finished and I paint up here, where it's totally different up different here. Light and, it's different, uh -huh. it's open, and it's, it's moving it into another location so that I see it differently. Um, you know, it's, it's really truly stepping back. Mm -hmm. And then it, I, I allow it to look at me and Go, why didn't I see this? You know, I, I see it differently. I see it all over again. Um, 
so th- there, there's there's a lot going on. Yeah. You know? yeah. In addition to the narrative of like these these characters, where suddenly they like they like they look back at me. Suddenly <laughs> there's someone there looking yeah. at me. Yeah. And it's always a surprise when it's done. So it really is a, a different. You're creating a person who then sort of has a, a autonomous life, and then you have to react to it, or you do react to it. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think part of that, is, you know, I mean, as you describe it, even even the verbal description is is very illuminating, I, and I think it is fun to capture a little bit of that on, on and, and some visual form on video, just so that. I don't know. People have a, a better sense of how how uh, a painting evolves and how it changes and and how your your own personal moods and as you say different different times of day that you're working or you come back to it and why didn't I see that? I, I think it, it it has to be seen as a process, you know, an important part of the final product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you ever listen to music or? You know, you talked about rituals that artists have, you know, putting a, maybe a coffee cup in the right place or, you know, <laughs> adjusting the shade or whatever. Do, do, are there any things that you do that um, you, you told me that you, you know, you started to read something that wasn't too engaging so that you could stop and then go to your <laughs> painting? But um, do, you, do you get obsessive about your rituals and is there... I mean, I'm thinking, for example, when uh, Faulkner was writing, I can't remember if it was Sound in, in the Fury or Light in August, I think it might have been Sound in the Fury, he was listening to Rhapsody in Blue, which was very interesting to me, you know, that mm-hmm. and Jackson Pollock liked to listen to jazz when he was painting. And do you do anything like that? And does it have an impact? It does. It sounds very crazy, but... Um... I, I, I have music, it goes on, and I told you, I, it's like when I'm right there, I press the button, the music starts, and I start working. That's uh-huh. like, that's it. Um, and I don't do anything else. I start, and I don't play the music until I start, and I'm uh-huh. ready, I turn it on, and I start, start painting. But, um, but I tend to listen to the same thing for the entire life of the painting. So if um, I'm listening to one particular CD, and I come back after you know, three, four sessions or a week and I put something else on, it doesn't work. I have to go back to the other music. I, it, it, it's, the music has its own rhythms and its own, you know, there, there's, and then the artwork has a certain cadence to it and it's like shifting. It's as if mm-hmm. somebody were to suddenly come in and say, well, you can't use these colors that you used before. You can only use these colors now. And you end up making something totally different. Uh-huh. And it's the same thing. It's that it, um, the, the music is ingrained in, in how I'm moving and where I am. And, and I have it on repeat. So it's not like I'm even, you know, I'm going in and out of the music. And I know it. And I have a very limited... Um, repertoire of music that I listen to when I'm painting um, I don't know how or why um, I choose one or another when I start something uh-huh. yeah. how it relates to the nature of the work whether it's um, you know going to be something more intimate or less intimate I am not quite sure of how I make that decision initially but it definitely has to you know it plays through to the very end of the work hmm. so um, and there isn't that much music I can listen to, you know, hour after hour after hour for weeks. So. That's it. I don't know what I so, would do in that case. That yeah. would be very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But but it is a, a, a sort of mnemonic that works for you. I mean, it gets you into that zone and keeps you there. Mm-hmm. Have you ever tried painting without music? You know, sometimes I go in and I realize I haven't turned on the music, and then I can't turn it on. Mm-hmm. I'll turn it on. I, I turn it off right away. Yeah. Because I'm in a another state, different place. Different place. Hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I use totally different music when I draw. I never use the same music when I draw as I use when I paint. Uh huh. Have a different set. It's kind of like having a different wardrobe when I'm in LA and another wardrobe when I'm in in uh-huh. New York. Mm-hmm. I have certain clothes that I pack and I take with me, and I never wear them here. Uh huh. It's pretty strange. <laughs> yeah, it's a way of organizing, you know, organizing your your energy, you know, and 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 um, 
structuring it, right? I mean, it, it, I can understand it. I, I can. In, it's just interesting. I, I think I would have trouble listening to the same music for, I mean, these canvases take a long time. Yeah. And I think that would be a challenge. But if it keeps you in the zone, then that, <laughs> that's fine. Hmm. Yeah. So now, th going forward, and you think about where your art is, do you sense that, for example, you look back at your life, you see you see different phases that your painting goes forward, uh, goes through. Can you imagine anything going forward? Do you feel like directions you might not like, to, you might like to pursue, or places you might like to explore that um, are, you know, you don't know exactly what they're going to be. How does that happen when one makes a shift, you know, it, it, and you realize that it is a shift, either mm -hmm. at the time or later? Mm -hmm. what? Well, actually, something like that happened to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Usually, I, like when it's within painting, I will have a period where I'm wondering what I'm doing and, and it feels really odd and I feel like I'm maybe in a transitional period and then it just goes on not for one or two paintings but for like a year or two and I realize that, that in fact that transitional period is the new period. But I had an experience, oh, going back, um, hmm about um, six years now, five years ago, mm -hmm. where um, something I never expected, I was someplace and I realized that um, what I needed to do for what I wanted was to um, take a series of photographs and draw on them. Mm. I was in a, a cemetery in Northern California. It affected me very strongly. I went there um, and then I went back and then I went back a third time, and then finally I, I photographed there, and then I kept the photographs for a long time, and then I had them printed, and I kept them for the prints for a long time, and then finally I, I started drawing them. It felt very um, transgressive. I was using other people's pain and sorrow and their life experience, but I did this series and did a book of um, these photographs and with drawn ghosts, the ghosts, the people who had passed, the people who had mourned. Um, and so I did that body of work and I thought it would be an isolated thing. Mm -hmm. um, but actually then I did another project. Um, I was in, um, in Austria and I was near the Hungarian border and I did a border piece where I walked the mile to the border to Hungary and I photographed in and around the border area mm -hmm. and was thinking a lot about um, migration and borders and people leaving Hungary in 56 and um, so I did a second large project mm. it was even larger than the cemetery project said, well it's two projects <laughs> and then um, you see where this is going? I then did a third. And it was actually when um, Sarah Cahill was um, in San Quentin when she did her, her concert. And some of us were allowed to go and be part of um, the audience for this concert. When we got our clearance and we were going, and I was very excited. And I, many of us, I think, are very um, concerned about our prison culture in this country. Yeah. And, um, yeah, a, a lot of people, um, even even young students that I was interviewing for the Region Scholarship on campus, were involved with um, Innocence Project. And there are a lot of stories on the radio at the time. Um, so this was a couple of years ago, um, and so I knew that I wanted to do another project there, and I went in advance because you can't take anything in with you, obviously, when you go in. But I photographed around the area and uh -huh. did. Um, presuming, not, not presuming that I could understand anything about the experience of incarceration, but for the impact on those around and notions of inside and outside and freedom yeah. and open space. So then I did another project there. And lo and behold, I find that a lot of what I'm doing <laughs> is like this. So I did a, I was an artist in residence this summer in Tracy. And um, before I went, I, I went in and the building, the um, Grand Theater Center for the Arts, 
um, has a long history. The building itself, although it's been redone now, has theaters and dance um, studio and art classroom studios and the gallery. But it has a checkered past, and in that past was um, that Tracy was really important as a center for prostitution and brothels mm -hmm. at the time when all the trains, train loads would come of men from San Jose and from the city just to enjoy the, uh, the women of <laughs> Tracy. Oh. And you're right, exactly. So then I, I went in advance <coughs> photographing there and, and um, had the ghosts of the the men and the women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's really become a whole nother thing. So when you ask about what I see and what you um, I now know that I don't know what the future holds. You know, this I, this was something I would never have expected yeah, um, yeah. 15 years ago or, you know, even 10 years ago, but has actually captured me. And it's very satisfying. I actually love it. Mm. Um, I see real limitations to it because it's... Um, uh, so codified, really, in terms of what? what it looks like with these ghosts. So it's it's going to have an end, but I haven't uh -huh. reached the end yet. But interesting that, that, that you have the historical dimension and you want to m bring it to life in the present uh -huh. context. I mean, that's a, that's a quite exciting way of thinking about the material. And you know, then you have these amazing surprises, like who knew that Tracy was the home of prostitution? Wow certain period of time mm -hmm. yeah well um <coughs> so you can pretty much count on things i mean i think that's just must be as you're talking i'm thinking as an academic and um as someone whose life has been you know at least professionally very programmed you know you you get your phd you you get a job you you get tenure you're an assistant professor an associate professor full it's all very uh formalized and uh, I'm, I'm listening to you and realizing um, that you, you, and I think most artists are so um, uh, alive in the moment that your work is, is uh, you know, has to do with your actually whatever it is you're doing at this moment. Not that it isn't for everybody, but I think you're much more conscious of being in the moment and working in in a specific way at a specific time than I think probably people who have a more programmatic life mm -hmm. you know I mean it, it, it's, it's very interesting because people with a programmatic life are always thinking about the goal they're trying to to reach and it's kind of like what the uh, Fitzgerald says in The Great Gatsby is that you know as people are kind of running toward the green light toward the horizon their life you know the present is just receding into the past and they're scarcely aware of it because they're so focused on what's ahead. And I think that um, artists just don't live that way. But it also makes it a little more precarious because, you know, if, you, if you've got a, say, a profession like you're an academic, you do have the structure that helps to contain energy and focus it and direct it and, and reduce anxiety. Well, I don't know, there are anxieties everywhere all the time, but, but, but you know, it's a real privilege, I think, to be able to live in the moment the way artists do, but it's also, you know, it is, it is a higher level of, you know, you're thrown back on yourself a lot more than you would be otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't seem to, you seem to negotiate that aspect of it very well. I, you know? I, I, I think when, when you are making art, you want to be doing something new each time. Mm -hmm. you, you don't want to be repeating yourself and you want to remain excited and engaged by the work. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, it's, if you're in that position, there's something that is in fact frightening maybe, <laughs> you know, uh, risk-taking, yeah, yeah. risk-taking in that sense, yeah. that um, you know, it could be really, really stupid <laughs> you know, maybe you're gonna do something that's really stupid or it's not gonna work or it's not gonna you know be what you thought it was gonna be for whatever reason or maybe you you know what you're doing is misdirected um, but I think the saving grace and what allows us to do that in fact is that for the most part um, you know with 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 pain
painting, with drawing in particular, drawing, it's fast. We're not committing, you know, huge amounts of time and resources. I mean, I think if you want to talk about something that I think is really risk-taking and scary, it would be filmmaking, where you're involving the time, energy, resources of so many people for mm-hmm. such a period of time. Yeah. And there's so much at stake. I mean, that to me would be terrifying. <laughs> Uh, and, and so I think this is kind of um, an easier way out, I mean, um, in, in terms, and, and I think when you're a young artist, you always think about film, you know, certainly um, we always talked about film a lot. And in a sense, you could see this as a lot of film stills in, in, in cinematic, in the sense of a long narrative, ongoing narrative yeah. that spans you know, 50 hmm. years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> and, right. And, and it, it's just that it's sort of been like um, hand animation at my kitchen table mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. compared to like a real film studio in that sense. But uh, probably if I were writing, you know, the great American novel and committing years and then years again to another book, it would be more like, you know, um, that invested... Um, huge undertaking, which I wouldn't have the nerve to do. <laughs> uh-huh. So you don't, you, you're seeing that each painting is a, a new beginning and a new, new possibility. And it isn't, it isn't as though any given painting is consuming a huge amount of energy, but, but in a way it is because, you know, the fact is you're committing yourself to creating, you know, a new work every whatever, however often, and it's 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 not I don't think in some ways that different from the film studio. I mean, it's your life. It's what you're doing your whole life. Yeah. And well, maybe maybe seeing it all together or being judged by the yeah, entire body yeah. would be. But in terms of the criticality, that you know, if a painting is like it, it, you know, if it's all like, you know, you just you just can't pull it together, then you know, you. One, you could always paint over it. You just, mm. you mean, you just work it until it changes. Right. Um, wow. Maybe, you know, maybe the editing room is the saving grace for mm-hmm. the filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't have the option of going out and, you usually don't have the option of going out and reshooting. You know, right, right. people's lives move on and they're not available and things mm-hmm. just are not yeah. there for you to do. Yeah. Whereas a painting you can go back to you know, six months later, a year later, if you couldn't mm-hmm. figure it out, and you can figure it out later. Uh-huh. And, and, and uh-huh. so there, I mean, it's kind of exciting while you're doing it, and emotionally there's that criticality, but ultimately you can always go and redo things and change things and alter them, and you can, you know, you can go yeah. in with a pen and... You know, mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you can now, how do you feel, for example, when you complete... You, know, you complete a given canvas. Um, 